I'm Gavin, you know, um, or as you can call me, Dr. Gavin Kerr. Um, I teach philosophy at St. Patrick's College, Maynooth. Um, so that's it's just outside of Dublin in County Kildare. Um, it houses uh, our national seminary, but we also offer uh, you know degrees to uh, non ecclesiastical students as well. So we offer degrees in philosophy, you know, undergraduate, postgraduate, up to doctoral level. And yeah, so I, I teach philosophy there. I've been teaching philosophy there since September. And um, really in philosophy, um, I specialize in several different areas. Um, the two main historical philosophers that I'm that I'm really interested in are Aquinas and Kant. So Aquinas and Thomas Aquinas, 13th century Italian uh, Dominican thinker, and Immanuel Kant, um, 18th century uh, German Prussian um, thinker. So they're, they're, they're the two key thinkers that I'm really interested in. Um, and I do work in the history of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, philosophical logic, and recently I've been getting into ethics. And I published a few bits and pieces just on uh, Aquinas and uh, the different areas that I'm interested in. And I have a book uh, that I wrote in, uh, well, I published in 2015 on one of Aquinas' proofs of God, which he wrote in his early 30s. And then I just brought out a book last year in 2019 there on uh, Aquinas, just on the metaphysics of creation and the whole issue of creation. Um, I've also just completed another manuscript on Aquinas' five ways, and I'm working on another manuscript on the resurrection, life after death, that sort of stuff. And um, I've got a few articles coming out and, you know, a few bits and pieces of here and here and there. So, so that's me. That, that's what I do. And, you know, as you say, I'm a martial artist and, you know, married <laughs> to children. And that's, that's that. Yeah. You're also a third, a third or a Dominican as well, aren't you? You're part of I am, our, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Is, would you explain briefly what is the third order of Dominican as well? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the Dominicans are the order of preachers founded by St. Dominic. And so the idea was that, um, you know, in the 13th century, um, well, sort of late 12th, early 13th century, um, there was um, the heresy known as uh, the Albigensian heresy. And it was a, it's, it's a really old sort of heresy. The idea here is that the body is evil, the spirit is good. And, you know, uh, between between bodily materiality and spirituality, there's like this constant battle. It's a theme that you find in the history of philosophy, particularly in Platonism. Uh, and so in this view, um, death is seen as, you know, a great, something to be welcomed, something which liberates the soul from its bodily prison. And uh, obviously that's not a Christian outlook, it's definitely not a Catholic outlook. And, uh, but this really took root. And the reason why it took root was because, well, first of all, um, the, the Catholic preachers at the time, they were hardly, they weren't living what could really be called, you know, a genuine Catholic lifestyle. So they were hardly leading by example. And they're also just ineffective. They were ter terrible preachers. So St. Dominic um, decided, you know, well, the way to deal with this is, you know, to live a proper, you know, sort of Catholic lifestyle, practice what you preach, and to actually preach um, and, and do it properly. And so he founded the Dominican Order and, or, well, the Order of Preachers. And he sent his brothers, his friars, out to all the various universities uh, across Europe to situate themselves there. Because if you're going to preach, you have to know what you're preaching about. So um, very quickly, the central charism of the Dominican order, one of preaching, um, led to an intellectual life, a, a life uh, of the intellect, of the mind, which could lead one to holiness, which could lead one to sanctity. And um, that, was, that was the formation, that was the foundation of the order of preachers, initially the friars, then very, uh, but around about the same time, the contemplative nuns, that's, that's the nuns, the, the women who uh, do nothing but pray and contemplate all day, they pray for the mission of the friars. But at the same time, there was a number, a number of non-ordained, non-consecrated individuals uh, living within the secular world who were drawn to the order and drawn to the charism of the order and that became the third order the tertiaries or the, the lay dominicans as we call them today the saint catherine of siena probably the most famous uh, member but also you've probably heard of pierre Giorgio frasati as well um also third order dominican and i'm one of those so my ticket to heaven as it were my way of life is that of a dominican of you know preaching the gospel uh, in whatever way i can um uh, as living within the secular world so yeah i've been a third order dominican for about 10 years now Ten years, wow. Thank, that's, yeah. that's fantastic to hear, uh, Dr. Gavin. That's great. To hear. <laughs> okay. Uh, so before before Dr. Gavin enters into his topic for today, uh, you may have many of us may have many questions. So feel free to post the questions in the chat here on the side, uh, and you know Dr. Gavin will be 
answering each question as much as you can at the end so that you know we don't break the flow of the session and during this time we'll be also keeping our mics mute except dr gavin he'll be speaking with us um and you know if you don't want to post the questions publicly you can send it to me privately and i can ask them on your behalf to dr gavin as well so dr mm. gavin you can take it off from here now okay great cool thanks very much yeah so um as uh, as i said there uh, any questions you have, I'm, I'm always happy to answer or engage with questions as much as I can. That doesn't mean that I'll answer them, but I'll certainly engage with them as much as I can. And, you know, my, I've got my evening is free, so, um, you know, I'm happy enough, you know, to go on as much as you guys want to go on. I'll speak for about 40 minutes to begin with, and, uh, and I'll go through the argument for God's existence and the, the issues surrounding that. And then if there's any questions, as undoubtedly there will be, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there, from there and we'll talk through them. I'll also put up my email address. Um, so if anybody wants to contact me through email, it's no problem. You know, we can kind of, you know, go at it there via email, you know, tease things out via email. Also, you know, I'm on Facebook. If anybody wants to contact me on Facebook as well, you know, happy enough to oblige about that. Okay, so the existence of God, argumentation for demonstrating the existence of God, proof of God, all that sort of juicy stuff, yeah. Um, I'm very aware that we have a mixture of academics and non-academics within the audience. So I'll try to get it at a level where the non-academics kind of, you know, are kind of learning new stuff, new terminology, which I'll explain as I go along. But I'll also, for the academics, try to give something which is, which is of interest as well, so everybody leaves happy. And sure, at the end, during the question time, so if you just want to maul me with questions, that, that's fine. You can do that. So um, the first thing to note about the existence of God the existence of God is not an article of faith, okay? The existence of God is not an article of faith, for Catholics, that is, okay, in Catholicism. So it's not something which you hold on the basis of faith, okay? Technically, it's what's known as a preamble to faith. And just in case you don't trust me, um, that ca that's what Catholics hold. The First Vatican Council explicitly teaches that the existence of God is something demonstrable to natural reason. And the reason why that's the position is because there are a number of articles of belief which um, are binding, are de fide for Catholics, uh, and all of them pertain to how God in some way relates to the world, or, or sorry, not how God relates to the world, how the world relates to God, or something to do with the inner life of God but none of them pertain to the actual existence of God. And the reason for this is that if you have faith in, say, God's plan for salvation or, say, that, that, that um, divinity is triune, that, you know, God is Trinity, you know, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all of that, you actually have to believe in God prior to having faith in that. Faith comes after belief in God, so the belief in God can't actually be something which you hold on the basis of faith. That then means that the existence of God is something which is demonstrable prior to one, prior to when one gives the assent of faith. Now, there's a bit, there's a bit of a twist to that um, when it comes to the actual individual. Does that mean every individual, you know, before they have the act of faith, they have to, you know, give some sort of demonstrative proof of God? The answer is no. Um, but it means that systematically speaking, God's existence is demonstrable prior to uh, the actual act of faith being made. And this is the sort of thing that um, our medieval philosophers and theologians engaged in. And this is something that attempts to demonstrate the existence of God. It's something that goes right back into the history of philosophy, right back to the very early beginnings of philosophy, um, arguably in the pre-Socratic philosophers and some of them, uh, but uh, explicitly in uh, major Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, you see demonstrations for some sort of primary cause of all that is there. And then that really takes off um, within uh, Judeo-Christian uh, philosophy and theology. So all the major monotheisms have representatives which offer these uh, demonstrations for God's existence and uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And in fact, um, St. Thomas Aquinas, who we're going to be focusing on, he really is influenced quite heavily by an Islamic thinker called uh, Ibn Sina, or Latinized version is Avicenna, major, major thinker in uh, the history of Western thought, arguably 
um, Western scholasticism, that's your, your Aquinas, your Albert the Great, your Scotus, wouldn't have looked the way it did if it wasn't for this Islamic thinker, Avicenna. Major, major thinker. Really recommend him if you get a chance to read some of his work. Um, although Aquinas, you know, sharply disagrees with him. So God's existence is something which uh, philosophers have, you know, attempted to demonstrate um, throughout the history of philosophy. And within uh, Catholicism, it's something which is ta taken to be demonstrable prior to the act of faith being made. But that doesn't really help us an awful lot. That doesn't say, I mean, the First Vatican Council notoriously doesn't say which sort of demonstration can be used to demonstrate God's existence. Only that uh, God's existence is demonstrable. So I'm going to take you through a demonstration of God's existence. It's one that, that I think is at the heart of all of Aquinas' uh, demonstrations for God's existence. And it's the one that he wrote uh, that, that I looked at in my 2015 book. And he wrote it in a, in a little treatise called De Ente Essentia, On Being in Essence. And it appears in chapter four in most uh, editions of that. And St. Thomas wrote this when he was just finishing up as a student at Paris. And he was living at the Dominican house at St. Jacques. And his fellow Dominicans, they, they, they couldn't understand the metaphysics that they were being taught. So Thomas wrote this wee treatise just to help them get through metaphysics. If anybody is interested in kind of a nice wee introduction to metaphysics, it's an excellent introduction. It's about 30 pages long, five, six chapters in most editions. And this uh, argument for the existence of God, this comes in in the fourth chapter. And so I'm going to kind of just take you through the gist of it, um, you know, sort of, sort of lay it out for you give you an idea of it, and then we can have a nice discussion of it afterwards, uh, go in and out through it and see how that goes. So, um, the demonstration for God's existence, which Thomas offers in this work, it's a causal demonstration. And what we mean by that is that in this proof, Thomas is going to try to demonstrate that, that there is some primary cause or a fundamental cause without which there would be nothing. So all things derive their existence from this primary or fundamental cause. Nothing would be were, were it not for this primary cause. So immediately the issue of uh, causality and cause and effect comes in here. So we'll just take a wee moment just to reflect on what causality and cause and effect is. And then we'll take it from there and we'll look at uh, causal series, how causal series are set up and how we get to a primary cause of causal series and why we think that the, 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 the fundamental primary cause is God. So if we think about cause and, uh, cause and effect, an effect is something which depends on its cause in a certain respect. Uh, effect is derived from, it comes from its cause. Um, given the effect, we can infer back to some sort of cause for that effect. Um, now, there were some developments um, in philosophy, especially with David Hume, um, but arguably you can see this in uh, the thinkers before David Hume, but, David Hume especially, you know, kind of put a stamp on things that, you know, he, he disputes that account of causality. We can draw that out in the question time. Happy enough to go through that in the question time, but just for the sake of the presentation, I'm going to flag that, that, you know, Hume gives an, an alternative account of causality, one quite different from that. So if anybody wants to bring that up in questions, uh, we can do that, no problem. Uh, but I'm just going to, for the, for the sake of progressing with the argument, I'm going to kind of set Hume aside there. So in this account of causality, an effect depends on its cause in some manner. Uh, it comes from and is derived from its cause, and its cause, the cause is responsible for uh, the effect in some sort of way. Without the cause, there would be no effect in question. The effect is lacking in some sort of respect, um, and the respect in which it's lacking, the cause is responsible for that. So the classic example we always have of cause and effect is, um, you know, you've got the snooker balls, one of the snooker balls is motionless. Well, the snooker balls are motionless, and it takes the snooker player to come in and introduce motion to one of them, the white ball, let's say, and then that hits the other ball, you know, the red ball, which hits another ball, and so on. So, it so the balls in themselves are without motion. Indeed, the snooker cue is without motion. And it takes the player to come in as the cause of motion to kind of, you know, get things going there. They introduce motion to the cue, to the balls, uh, and so on, to bring about something. So um, the, the, the effects here, the balls and the cue, they're lacking with respect to the motion. And then the player comes in and as the cause of motion, he gives them motion, he brings motion about in the balls. Well, for whatever reason, if they're playing a game or he's, a, if in, the, he's in a competition or whatever. That very quickly sets up what's called a causal series. So a causal series is basically just a series where you have cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, and so on and so on. And in a causal series, 
there's some kind of causality at work. That's how the kind of series is connected up together. You've got a kind of causality in the series, and that causality kind of brings uh, the members in the series together. So if you think about that snooker ball example and, and the cue and the player, the, the cue and the balls, uh, they're without motion in themselves. So just in themselves, they're inert. They don't have motion of themselves. Um, and the player comes in and gives the causality of motion to the cue and to the balls. Um, you could also think, say, of a Newton's cradle. So, you know, a Newton's cradle, it's just, you know, you've got the balls hanging there and you lift one ball up and it hits the other one and the motion goes down through the balls till the end one and the end one goes up and then, you know, it just swings back and forth, back and forth. Uh, again, that's another type of causal series. So causality isn't relegated simply to a relationship between two um, distinct things. It can spread over many distinct things, and that's what constitutes our causal series. But when it comes to causal series, our medieval, our medieval philosophers uh, and our theologians, they um, recognize two distinct kinds of causal series. Um, I'm going to introduce some terminology here. There's one type of causal series, and it's called a per accidents causal series. Um, in a later terminology, which was brought in by John Dunn Scotus, um, philosopher from just north of England, south of Scotland, in Berwickshire, we thought for centuries that he was from Ireland, given his uh, name Scotus, but he was actually, you know, northern England, southern Scotland. Um, he called these accidentally ordered series, or in an older terminology, they're known as uh, per accidents or ordered series. So there's the per accidents ordered series, and then you have what's called a per se or the later terminology, essentially ordered series. So you just keep that sort of, you know, those discrete. You've got per accidents order series, and you've got uh, per se ordered series. So how do we kind of disentangle this? How do we disentangle these kinds of uh, series? Well, the way in which we do so is that a per accident series is a causal series in which the members possess the causality of the series in themselves in virtue of what they are. And I'm going to give you an example. We'll, we'll tease that out, okay? But that's just kind of, you know, how we distinguish them. A per accident series, the members have the causality of the series essentially. They have it in virtue of what they are. And that's in contrast to the per se or the essentially ordered series. The members of that series don't have the causality of the series essentially or in virtue of what they are. So a per accident series, the members have the causality of the series in virtue of what they are. And in the per se series or the essence and order series, they don't have it in virtue of what they are. So examples, examples always get the ball rolling. The classic example of a per accident, the accidentally ordered series, is a chain of fathers producing sons. So a father produces his son and he produces a son and he produces a son and so on and so on and so on, and so back and so back and so back. Um, so imagine Peter produces James and James produces John. Okay, so you've got Peter, James, and John. Peter is the father of James. James is the father of John. The causality um, with respect to that series is fatherhood or paternity or whatever you want to name the sort of causality that, you know, the father contributes in producing the son. Uh, and that's the causality which is involved. So when it comes to paternity, when it comes to fatherhood, um, Peter is able to beget or to father James in virtue of what he is. He's a biologically functioning male, uh, and in being a biologically functioning male, he is able to father James. James, as a biologically functioning male, is able to father John. So they possess the causality in themselves as biologically functioning males. Now, here's the kick. James, who is Peter's son, doesn't need Peter's help to father John. Okay, James is the father of John. John is Peter's grandson. James doesn't need his father's help to produce his own son. Okay, so children don't need their parents' help to produce their own children. Okay, that's not how that works. All right, we all know how that works. We all know how you father children uh, and how you bring about children. So James, as a biologically functioning male, can father his own son. Peter could be dead by the time that James comes to produce John. Okay, so Peter is the father of James. He's the cause of James with respect to fatherhood. Peter can go off and die, and James can father John. James can go off and die, and John can father whoever, and then he can father whoever, and so on and so on. 
what that indicates is that in per accident uh, series or uh, accidentally ordered series, causality is terminated in an immediately succeeding, immediately preceding cause and an immediately succeeding effect. Peter is the cause of James, but he is not the cause of John, his grandson. James is the cause of John in, in terms of fatherhood. And this is because Peter could be dead by the time that James comes to, you know, have John, Father John. So you can imagine Peter, he, um, he has his child, he has James, and he's all happy about it. And he decides to go out and wet the baby's head. That's an Irish tradition. Um, that's going out and getting drunk because, you know, you've just had your first child. And now let's say he goes out and does that. And tragically, he dies. Um, we'll not make it too gruesome, not from alcohol poisoning. Let's say, you know, he fell in the, what's the river down in Dublin? The Liffey. He fell in the Liffey on the way home, something like that. Um, so Peter's gone. James has grown up without a father. And yet, James is still able to produce his own son, John. That indicates then that the members of per accidents order series have the ability to act as causes within the series of themselves in virtue of what they are. They're not dependent on the earlier members of the series for their causality. And what Aquinas and several others spotted with that is that such a series can be beginningless. It can be without a beginning because every member of the series is accounted for by its immediately preceding member. So it could be potentially infinite. Uh, there doesn't need to be a primary cause in that kind of series. It could be potentially infinite. So as long as you always have a prior member, every member in the series is accounted for. And the idea here is that, you know, you've got a father, he produces a son, the father dies, the son produces a son, that one dies, he produces a son, that one dies, and so on and so on and so on. Actually, at any one time, the series is finite. You just have a father and a son but it is potentially infinite because if, you know, through succession, it can go through an infinity of members. So per accidents ordered series, they do not need a first in terms of, there isn't, just because everything has a father doesn't mean there's a father for everyone in the series. There isn't a primary father and all father in which all the members of that series participate uh, in order to be fathers. And that's the per accidents ordered series. Now, the per se ordered series is a, is a different kind of series by contrast. Um, and the classic example of this, the one that Aquinas uses and the one that I always use whenever I'm um, developing it, is uh, the mind or the mental agent or whatever you think is the sort of the cause or responsible for agent action or agent causation within a series. Uh, we'll just call it the mind for now. The mind moves the hand to move the stick to move the stone. So think about that. The mind moves the hand to move the stick to move the stone. Um, an alternative I always give, kind of, it's the same one, but it's the golf player. He moves his hands to move the, the club or to swing the club to hit the ball. Okay. Um, there's another one, uh, which is the fire heats the pot, heats the contents of the pot. Now look at that kind of series. This is our per se series. In this series, the, uh, the hand, the stick, and the stone they don't have the causality of that series in virtue of what they are. So uh, the causality here with the mind moving the hand to move the stick to move the stone, that's motion, okay? The hand, the stick, and the stone are immobile, just in and of themselves. They don't move in virtue of themselves. So stones are just inanimate, they're inert, they're subject to external forces, same with sticks. Hands, if you just take a hand in itself, sever a hand, don't do it, but if you just take a severed hand, it doesn't move in itself unless it's connected to a living body, um, which living body engages in some sort of, you know, an agent causation to move the hand to do something. So in the case of a golf player, then the golf player thinks, you know, well, you know what, it'll be a good idea to go and, you know, have a game of golf. And so he moves his hands to swing the club to hit the ball. So in that sort of series, um, you have the hand, the stick, and the stone. They are essentially immobile in themselves. So they do not have the causality of the series in themselves. In which case, the causality that they do have, they derive from some sort of cause, which is the mind or the agent in this case. The agent in this case does have the causality of the series in himself. Let's say it's the golf player. He has it in himself. So mental agents are just the kinds of things which are able to originate motion. You know, you can just have an idea, let's say, and you think, you know, this will be a good idea. I'll do this. 
and they engage in that sort of activity. So the golf player thinks, you know, it'll be a good idea for whatever reason to go and play golf. And so he moves his hands to move the stick, uh, to swing the club, to hit the ball. So the sort of cause which kind of originates the causality in that sort of series is a cause which possesses the causality in itself. Whereas the secondary members of the series, the hand, the stick, and the stone, they are without the causality. They don't have the causality in virtue of themselves. Whereas the primary cause here, the, the agent, does have the causality in virtue of itself. That's what it is to be a primary cause in that sort of series. It's to possess the causality of the series in itself or in virtue of itself. The same is the case with the, the other example. The fire heats the pot to heat the contents of the pot. The contents of the pot and the pot itself aren't naturally hot, okay? They're not self-heating unless it's some form of technology where they, you know, they depend on, well, even then it wouldn't be self-heating. They would be dependent on something else to kind of get the technology going. But the pot and the contents of the pot, they are just um, in themselves not hot, whereas they depend on something else for their heat, be that the sun or the fire or whatever. Now, fire is just one of those things, given its constitution, which can produce heat. In the same way that a mental agent is just one of those things, given its constitution, that can produce motion. So the fire is the cause for the, the heat of the pot and of the contents of the pot. You take away the fire, then immediately the contents of the pot and the pot itself start to cool unless you put in some other source of heat. And that's because those things don't essentially have heat, whereas the fire is something which does essentially have the causality of heat. Um, same as the case for the mind, hand, stick, stone example. When the agent undertakes to move his hands, to move the stick, to move the stone, if something happens to the agent, let's say he's on the golf course and he gets hit by lightning, uh, and that just stops the, the motion of the series dead on its tracks. So let's say, you know, the golf player, he swings his club, he gets hit by lightning, he doesn't follow through with a swing, okay? Gravity or some other force takes over, and, and that takes over the motion in the series, but it doesn't follow through as the agent intended. So you remove the causality of the primary cause, okay? So you move the primary cause's activity in the series, you remove the causality of the effects which depend on that primary cause. That's essential to per se ordered series. And that's because the members of that series don't possess the causality in virtue of what they are. They are dependent on or participate in some cause which does possess the causality of the series, such that if you move, remove that cause, everything else just collapses within the series. So, you know, the hands, the, the stick, the stone, all of them just return to being immobile or the pot and the contents of the pot return to being cool. Um, and that's in contrast to the father-son series. We noted that Peter could go out and get drunk and die when his son is born, tragically, um, but James can still grow up and produce his own son. So the causality of that series can keep going precisely because the members of that series possess the causality of the series in virtue of what they are. So per accident series, they don't need a primary cause for the causality that they have, say, the fatherhood in that series, precisely because they have it in virtue of themselves. Whereas in per se series, you do need a primary cause for the particular causality in the series because the members don't possess it in virtue of themselves. So that if there were no cause of that causality of motion uh, in this case, then there just wouldn't be any causality in the series. You wouldn't have the causal series in question. They'd have hands, sticks, and stones, but they wouldn't be joined together in a causal series of one moving the other, moving the other. Okay, so that's just some metaphysics of causality and causal series. Okay, so you're into heavy stuff now, guys. Okay, this is what you know my undergraduate philosophy students and indeed some of my postgraduate philosophy students get. Okay, now here's the kicker, uh, and, th and this is where Thomas takes us. Um, so I'll give you the gist of this argument for God, and then we can kind of you know tease it out in question time. Thomas argues, uh, well, Thomas observes, look, things exist. We have things which are in existence, but things don't exist in virtue of what they are, okay? So we're all human beings, we're rational animals, that's what we are, okay? So that's, that's our essence, is rational animality. Let's say um, the essence of water, H2O. The essence of a thing is just its definitional content. The essence of a phoenix, let's say, is a bird that um, rises from its own death, that sort of thing. Um, Gandalf is, you know, a wizard, one of the Maya, the Grey Wizard, that sort of stuff for the Lord of the Rings fans. 
Um, things have essences, but things don't exist in virtue of their essences, okay? They don't exist in virtue of what they are. So just because I'm a rational animal, that doesn't make me exist. That's not why I exist. Um, I have to have what Thomas calls a distinct act of existence, okay? I have to have an act of existence which makes me as the rational animal I am exist, and which makes all you guys as the rational animals you are exist. Gandalf doesn't have an act of existence. Phoenixes, I don't think exist, so I'm gonna say that phoenixes don't have acts of existence. Um, and all sorts of non-existing things. They don't have acts of existence, where existing things do have acts of existence. Um, but given that essence and existence are distinct in those things, and there's a very technical argument to establish the distinction between essence and existence, we can get to that um, in, in, in the question time. It is quite a technical argument, but happy to go over it during the question time. Given that distinction between essence and existence, Aquinas looks at that distinct act of existence, and he thinks, right, okay, well, without this act of existence, the thing would be nothing. So the thing which exists depends on this act of existence in some sort of way. So that means that, you know, the act of existence is a kind of causality. It has some sort of causal influence on the thing. It's that without which the thing just wouldn't be at all. And so Thomas asks, well, look, is that kind of causality located in per se, in a per se ordered series, like the hands of stick and the stone, like motion in the hands stick and stone series, or in the per accidents series, like the fathers and sons? Well, the way in which we distinguish between the per se and the per accidents ordered series is um, if the members of the series possess the causality of the series essentially, that is in virtue of what they are, then they're members of per accidents ordered series. But if the members of the series don't possess the causality essentially in virtue of what they are, such as the hand, the stick, and the stone in the per se series, then the members are members of per se series. So if they possess it essentially, it's per accident series. If they don't possess it essentially, it's per se series. Now Thomas has argued that essence and existence are distinct. So the causality of existence is not a kind of causality that a thing which exists possesses essentially. I don't possess my existence, essentially. It's distinct from my essence. It's not separate from my essence. That's something that Thomas disagrees with with several authors. It's, it's merely distinct, non-identical to my essence. Um, so I don't possess it, essentially. I don't possess it in virtue of what I am. I don't exist just because I'm a rational animal, because there's lots of rational animals which no longer exist, and there's lots of rational animals which don't yet exist. Um, so existence isn't the kind of causality which is possessed in the way that, say, Peter, James, and John possess the causality of paternity or the ability to beget children. That then means that existence as a kind of causality isn't located in a per accidents ordered series, but it's located in a per se ordered series. It's a causality which is like the motion in the hand, stick, and stone series, the kind of causality that the things in the series possess not in virtue of what they are, but in some sort of derived or caused fashion. So everything in which essence and existence are distinct possesses existence in a derived or in a caused fashion. And given what we saw about per se ordered series and the metaphysics of per se ordered series, unless there's some primary cause, like the mental agent in the Handstick Stone series, unless there's some sort of primary cause, which just has that causality in virtue of what it is, which is able to originate that causality or bring about that causality in virtue of what it is, then the secondary members, such as the hand, stick, and stone, or existing things in this case, those secondary members simply wouldn't have the causality in question. So in this case, the causality in question is existence. So existing things wouldn't have that causality, i.e. existence, unless there were some sort of primary cause in which all those existing things participated in order to have their existence. And that cause is primary precisely because, as we saw with the metaphysics of per se series, it has that causality in virtue of what it is. It has existence in virtue of what it is. In this case, um, that primary cause doesn't just have existence. It simply is, as Thomas says, pure existence itself or you know, just pure existence. So it's this, um, so, so this primary cause just is sheer pure existence itself. And all existing things then participate in this or derive their existence from this at whatever time, at whatever moment uh, they exist, precisely because otherwise they would be nothing without that 
there would be nothing. So the usual sort of analogy which is used here, it's, it's, it's one which is drawn from Plato and the Neoplatonic tradition. And the idea here is that all existing things then stand for this primary cause uh, in the way that um, the things on the earth stand with regard to illumination of the sun. So if you imagine the primary cause of existence of all things, it's kind of like the sun. And then all the things on the earth then are illuminated by the light of the sun simply by kind of participating uh, within that light. That's how Thomas envisages all existing things uh, relating to this primary cause as the source of uh, all existence. It's pure existence itself, then everything just uh, participates in it or is illuminated uh, by its existence in order to be. Uh, and that just goes for everything in which essence and existence are distinct. Um, uh, and just being aware of the, the, the sort of group that I'm talking to is Sanctum. Um, one of the things that I kind of pointed out at the end of my 2015 book with this is that this cause, this primary cause of all things, which is just pure existence itself, um, it's kind of got a correlate in uh, the revealed history of the revealed scripture of the Old Testament. Uh, and now we, we, we've arrived at that conclusion without appealing to any revealed issues or any matters of faith or anything like that. But when we go to uh, the Old Testament, we go to the book of Exodus, we see God's revealing himself to Moses um, within the narrative. Um, we, we see God's revealing himself as uh, he who is. Okay, so, you know, Moses, he's in this conversation with God at the burning bush. And, um, you know, it, God is asking him, you know, to go back, you know, to free the, the, the Hebrew slaves. And, you know, Moses says, look, God, you know, how are they going to know that you sent me? You know, what's your name? You know, and so, you know, the assumption is that, you know, God's going to give him his name. And, you know, the, the Hebrew slaves are going to recognize, you know, that, you know, Moses was sent by God. So they're going to recognize this name. And, you know, you know, God says, you know, I am who I am, you know, he who is. Now, scripturally speaking, um, we used to believe that it was Moses wrote uh, the, the book of Exodus, the first five books of the Bible. Um, you know, there was some sort of author or set of authors um, wrote it. There is no known historical antecedent to uh, that conception of God as he who is or as Yahweh, okay, prior to the history of Israel. There are several different conceptions of God within um, Judaism, one of them being the Yahweh conception. But there's no known uh, historical antecedent uh, to that. So what we have then is you have this conception of God as Yahweh. And it, at some point in the history of Israel, uh, the Israelites, they came to this notion that God is Yahweh or he who is. Uh, and the book of Exodus kind of gives you the whole idea that it was revealed to Moses. But here's the thing. Um, we've just seen this philosophical demonstration of God and it's based on natural reason, you know, some in-depth metaphysics, which, you know, we can get into more depth uh, later. Uh, we've just seen that and we can arrive at this, you know, pretty solid conception of God as pure existence itself, which, you know, was, has a correlate with he who is, because only he who is could reveal himself as pure existence itself. And so the question they ask, this is the kind of, you know, question I teased at, at the end of my 2015 book. The question they ask is, is it just sheer coincidence that um, without engaging in all that heavy duty metaphysics or philosophy, that, you know, the people of Israel or somebody in Israel just came up with this notion of Yahweh, you know, God, as he who is, uh, which happens to be, you know, in accord with some, you know, in-depth sort of metaphysics that comes up, you know, a couple of millennia later. Or do we need to countenance the possibility that uh, there was a revelation to somebody uh, and that revelation worked its way into uh, the theology of uh, ancient Israel and into the holy books then of ancient Israel. And that's why the two accounts happen to coincide with each other uh, the way they do. So uh, just be aware of the group that I'm speaking to, you know, that's a sort of, you know, just something that'll tease. I'll leave that with you, that idea to think about that. But that's the demonstration of God's existence. Then uh, that's, that's the one that I defended in the 2015 book, and that's the one that Thomas came up with um, in his early 30s. Now, I, um, I certainly maintain, and uh, just, uh, there's a couple of other kind of Thomas scholars, not all the Thomas scholars, but there's a couple of other um, who hold the view that uh, that demonstration of God's existence, or at least the principles involved in it, reappear throughout Thomas's works. The, anywhere else that Thomas offers demonstrations of God's existence, that that uh, demonstration reappears. And one of the book manuscripts that I just finished uh, was on the five ways, um, argues that all of the five ways, the famous five ways of St. Thomas, 
um, they all deploy that argumentation in one way or another. They're all based on that sort of argumentation. That's for other reasons within Aquinas' thought. Aquinas thinks that you can only demonstrate God within metaphysics, not within what's called natural philosophy or the physics of Aristotle or anything like that. So um, Aquinas doesn't think you can demonstrate God in the way you know that some contemporary apologists do. They engage with a lot of the science of the matter, you know, they engage with Big Bang, intelligent design and all that, and they try to get to God from there. Aquinas doesn't think that that's possible. Aquinas only thinks it's possible to demonstrate God within metaphysics, and, and he's explicit about that. And he's explicit about that in a theological work, in a commentary on a theological work of Boethius. So he's explicit about that when writing as a Catholic theologian and free to presuppose all the, you know, the, the doctrines and dogmas of Catholic theology. He is adamant that you can only demonstrate God's existence um, within metaphysics, which I think is telling. Um, but that sort of demonstration then, that reappears uh, throughout uh, Aquinas' works. And um, so that's Aquinas' most cherished way to God. So um, I, I, I often refer to Aquinas' kind of demonstrations of God as Aquinas' way to God, to kind of lump them into that sort of one way based on causality and the, the distinction of causal series, which gets you to this absolutely primary cause of all that is. So that's what I have for you this evening then. Um, uh, we can either sort of talk a wee bit more or we can uh, get into questions. Um, I'm happy enough, um, whatever, you, whatever you guys want to do. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Gavin. There was a lot to, to be taking in there, uh, especially with the, uh, um, the first part of it about the causality and everything. But uh, yeah, does anyone have any, a few questions? Um, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So uh, there's a few questions in the chat. So let's just have a look. So, yeah. okay, I think there's a bit of a back and forth here. Right. Is God a thing? For a thing is that which has a finite degree of perfection, yet God is greater in perfection than everything. If God is greater in perfection than everything, and a thing is that which has a finite degree of perfection, then it seems that God is not a thing. <laughs> okay. And then Christopher kind of goes back. I don't see how we need to define thing that way. A question I thought of last night about these accidental series. On the B theory of time, does this talk about accidental series collapse? Because Peter still exists when John is around, so there might be a sense in which John is still dependent on Peter. Can we have a concurrent accidentally caused series? Sorry, but I have to leave. Okay, right. So, is God a thing? Yeah, so that's the interesting one. Um, God is certainly an individual. God is certainly unique. But God isn't an individual in the way that other things are individual. Um, so God isn't individual sort of in the way that we're all humans. We're all individuals of a species. Um, so we all share humanity in common. And there's something um, which individuates that humanity to each of us. Aristotle called it our matter, or our, um, yeah, our, our de or Thomas calls it our designated matter. So I have a particular kind of chunk of matter, which uh, makes me the individual human that I am, whereas you guys all have your individual chunks of matter with your own whole spatial temporal history, which makes you the individual humans that you are. So we have, it, we have humanity in common, and then our matter sort of individuates our humanity. God isn't an individual like that, okay? So when we think about, you know, God being one, um, that's not the way God is, you know, the one God, because that would still mean that, you know, God is one of a certain kind, as if, you know, there were only one human being, the last human being on earth. He wouldn't be uniquely one. He would just happen or to be the last one um, or the only one thus far. Um, God isn't, you know, sort of a, an individual that way. Rather, God's individuality stems from the fact that because God is pure existence itself, there is nothing other than him that could be like him, okay? So God just is pure existence. Everything other than God is caused to be by God. So everything other than God, everything this, you know, other than this primary source of existence is caused to be by this primary source of existence. That then means that everything other than God is unlike God. And so God is utterly unique in that way. There's nothing that it's like to be God other than being God. So God's certainly an individual. Um, if you want to say an individual is a thing, okay, well, you're, you know, you're talking a bit, a bit fast and loose with thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, you can have an analogical sort of notion of thing. You can just say, well, this is what I mean by thing in this context, I an individual. But this is what I mean by things in another context, I when talking about individuated substances. So um, I, I, would usually I would usually use the language of uh, individual uh, when talking about God rather than thing. Um, hopefully that sort of address, addresses the question, Lorenzo. 
Um, let's see. Uh, so, let me start on the Excel search call up. Peter still exists when John is around, so there might be a sense in which John is dependent on Peter. Well, we'll have to see the sense in which John um, would be dependent on Peter. Certainly wouldn't be dependent on Peter with regard to paternity, because John is dependent on James with regard to paternity. James is the father of John, not Peter. Peter is um, John's grandfather. So um, you can remove Peter entirely from the series, um, and James would still be uh, the cause of John with respect to paternity. So even if Peter were still around in some sort of way, it wouldn't make John dependent on him. It would just mean that they would coincide in some sort of way. Um, that's how I would maybe, you know, sort of, you know, get at that. Christopher, are you still here? Do you want to, um, if you want to turn your mic on, we can, you know, go at that if you want. Yeah, I was referring to the, um, are you to the B theory of time? Okay. Um, where I can't explain it very well. Um, I, like, have you heard of like the A theory and B theory of time before? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I always get them confused, you know. So the yeah. McTaggart business and the C theory. Yeah, I always get them confused. So which is which? A theory would be um, that only the present moment is mm. exists yeah. right yeah. now, and yeah. B yeah. theory would be. Mm -hmm. that every as far as i understand me theory would just mean that every that the distinction between like past present and future mm. is relative in the same way that like mm -hmm. the difference between like here and north of here and south of here yeah yeah are, yeah. are just relative yeah 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 so it's an index to the stance of the individual yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, e even in that case, you know, A theory or B theory, um, the metaphysics of the series would be the same because um, we're, we're talking about causal dependency um, with respect to, that, that, let's say, paternity. So when we look, say, at Peter, James, and John, we're asking, who is it that, you know, does what needs to be done for, you know, the one, the father, the other? Um, so simply because you have temporal coincidence on the B theory, let's say, um, that doesn't mean you have a causal dependency. Does that make sense? I think so. Uh -huh. I'll have to think about some more. Yeah. Um, and I guess, like, now that I'm talking, um, I guess maybe you could touch on um, existential inertia because that's, like, the main objection mm -hmm. as far as I know that, um, mm -hmm. that skeptics would, would put on this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the uh, existential inertia objection. Um, so the idea here is that, so, so Thomas has made an argument where he's looking at the existence of a thing. And he's asking, um, look, things have existence distinct from their essences. Uh, and so we need some sort of um, cause for the existence of those things. And, um, you know, we look at the metaphysics of the per se series and, you know, we have some sort of a, primary cause, which is pure existence itself. Now, unfortunately, um, an author that you might know of called Ed Fieser, or Edward Fieser, um, put, put forth a version of uh, this proof in uh, Five Proofs uh, for the Existence of God. And unfortunately, he, um, well, I mean, he, he says that the cause, um, he, he builds into one of the premises that, you know, the cause for the existence of the thing, or, well, he talks about, you know, the actualizer or something like that, has to be concurrent, it has to be extrinsic and concurrent, which is not the sort of, it's not one of the premises I use, it's not, it's not to be found in Thomas. I don't think that the concurrence of the cause with the effect is something that you, you infer given the different sort of causal situations we're dealing with. So we've got, you know, let's say, you know, we've got motion in one sort of case where we ask, is the cause concurrent in that case? And we just look and see if it is. We have existence in another case, and we ask, you know, well, is the cause concurrent in that case? And we just have to look and see what it is. So I think, you know, that Fieser has done a bit, is a bit problematic there in the way that he presents that. Uh, but the existential inertia objection wants to really attack that idea that um, any sort of derived causal feature that a thing has is dependent on some concurrent cause uh, by which it has it, so that insofar as you have a series, some sort of series of things, all of this derived causal feature, then you have some single cause 
um, with which all of these things in the series are concurrent and dependent on for that causal feature. And the existential inertia objection just goes, look, things have existence and they may acquire it at some sort of point in the past, but once they acquire it, they hold on to it unless something acts upon them for them to lose their existence. So it's, uh, it, it, it takes up you know, Newton's first law of motion, that a thing uh, will continue in uniform motion unless acted upon by some sort of you know, uh, force knocking it out of that uniform motion. Uh, and so things have this existential inertia once they get existence and they retain it uh, until something acts for them to stop them from existing. Um, and the idea here is that, so the way this is presented in the, you know, the likes of John Badoon and several others is that you don't need God um, to account for things continuing to exist. You need God to account for the things beginning to exist and for ending to exist. But they're beginning to exist, well, that's just something that they have inertially. Um, whereas on Aquinas' account, anything exists at any moment it exists because it participates in the causality of the primary cause. So how do we avoid that existential inertia objection? Well, we do so by looking at what Aquinas thinks of the nature of existence. Existence isn't something that um, a thing, which is kind of just floating about there, in the void sort of receives and holds on to, okay? So if things don't have existence, they just are not, they're simply nothing. Um, they're not kind of floating about in some sort of third non-existing state, awaiting to kind of get existence, and then once they get it, they kind of keep it in the way that, say, an example which is sometimes used in this case, the way it sure, say, has the color red, um, the only reason why it continues to have the color red is not that there's some sort of actualizer for that color red for as long as the chair has red. It's rather that once the chair has the redness, it keeps the redness until something comes along and, you know, dyes the chair a different color or brings it about that the, the chair doesn't have the color red. On that sort of account of inertia, the thing has to exist prior to the property that it has and the reason why it keeps it is because that thing remains in existence and it has that property with it remaining in existence. So on this view, the inertial property and the thing which has the inertial property are two sort of distinct things which kind of come and click together and remain together until something, you know, unclicks them. Um, I kind of call it the Lego block account. And so on that account, uh, for existence to be inertial, Existence would have to kind of attach to essence in the way two Lego blocks would click together, and God would sort of be responsible at the beginning for clicking the two together, and then at the end for separating the two. Now that's an account of existence which Thomas explicitly rejects in the commentary in the Metaphysics book four, lecture two. It's the Avicennian account of existence. It's um, the, the account of existence that Avicenna held, that essences sort of float about there in this sort of absolute state, and then they're just sort of granted existence. Thomas doesn't think that at all. Rather, Thomas thinks that existence is primary, pure existence itself is primary, and essence is just come to participate in existence. So it's not the essence which is fundamental with the existence attached to it. The existence is fundamental, and the essence comes to participate in it. And the idea there, then, is that existence isn't an inertial property like the color of the chair, because... Um, if you take away the color of the chair, the chair still remains. Whereas if you take away existence, nothing remains at all. So existence isn't like any of uh, our inertial properties. Um, and so that's kind of how I would uh, engage with the existential inertia objection. I've got a paper coming out um, in the autumn which uh, engages with that. There, there's very little written on it um, or, or has been published on it. So a lot of the kind of presentations of the actual objection are quite speculative because very few have actually developed it. Um, I, I'm aware that there's a few people who've got some submissions in, so hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get to have a look at those and see how that fares against uh, my response to it. How, how does that sit with you, Christopher? I guess it, it's a little worrying because it would seem as if this argument would then have to rely on like that point about um, existence being primary and the like. And it at least seems like something that someone could easily dispute. Um, mm -hmm. Also, yeah. mm -hmm. speaking of like assumptions that might be disputable, you, mm -hmm. you've mentioned before that um, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you need at least some form of epistemic realism for these arguments to kind of um, mm. to get going. Yeah. Like how um, mm-hmm. how how broad of an epistemic realism is is necessary? Um, do we mm-hmm. need direct realism? Because mm-hmm. um, I mean, obviously, not not everyone is a direct realist, and um, mm-hmm. I've at least heard arguments that um, particularly quantum mechanics is kind of difficult to jive with direct realism. It it's, it, it can jive well with other mm-hmm. um, aspects of like the Aristotelian mm-hmm. framework, but direct mm-hmm. realism is kind of maybe in trouble. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So probably the first thing to say there is that that this isn't an Aristotelian framework. Um, this is a yeah. this is more yeah. Platonic or Neoplatonic framework we're working out of. Um, so that that that's just kind of engages with the last point there. Um, the first thing then to say with the primacy of existence, yeah, I mean it's disputable, but I mean let's see the objection and see, you know, see where the dispute goes. Um, so the, the, the primacy of existence is that, you know, it's the act of all acts without it, um, nothing would be. Um, and so let, let's let see, you know, if somebody's going to make an objection, yeah, we'll, we'll see where that objection goes and we'll address it when the objection comes up. Um, and, it, and, it, and then take the argument from there. Obviously somebody who disagrees with Aquinas' metaphysics is going to disagree with this argument. Um, because the argument, you know, is an outgrowth of the metaphysics. It's not, you know, just standalone argument in itself. It, it kind of grows out of the metaphysics there. Um, with regard to the epistemic realism, yeah, um, the idea here is just that um, uh, the con- our conceptual content um, isn't a kind of, you know, a step removed um, from reality. That uh, reality brings into operation certain uh, conceptual capacities that we have. So that in uh, the best case scenario, our judgment that the world is thus and so is because the world is thus and so. Um, so really our conceptual content is just um, in, in conformity with um, the conceptual content of reality. So on this account, um, what we'll be committed to is the idea that there is no pure or naked given, um, that um, all reality is conceptual, uh, which, isn't, which isn't an idealism. Um, precisely because um, there is a distinction between the subject which conceives and the conceptual content which the subject conceives. Um, when we just talk about uh, the conceptual content of reality, we're just talking about the formed nature of reality. Um, so it would just be a very minimal um, epistemic realism, nothing too fancy. How does that sit with you? Um, I just thought uh, I'll have to think about it some more. I mean, you, you've given me stuff to chew on, and I guess that's. Definitely, so, definitely all you can really ask for. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Gavin, can I ask a question? Just um, say, you know the way you started off by saying, like, uh, with the Second Vatican Council and mentioning, like, the belief in God is prior to faith. How does that then work with a God who wants a relationship with us and mm. who wants, like, you know, with the biblical story then continuing and the different interventions that this... Uh, this pure existence itself, like mm-hmm. getting involved, especially in a species like human beings. Yeah, like how, yeah. how does that all kind of fit in over there then? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, so it's, it's the first Vatican Council. Um, uh, but I mean, the second, second Vatican Council, you know, brings up uh, the same sort of issues. Um, so hi, um, you know, we can have, you know, sort of, uh, the first Vatican Council teaches we can have demonstrative uh, proof of God's existence, but um, if I understand the question correctly, you know, how does that, you know, kind of fit in, you know, with having a relationship um, with God and all the rest? Well, when we think about relations, um, relations uh, or, or relationships, as it were, you think about friends, you think about spouses, you think about family members, um, think especially of a spouse or, or, you know, of a close friend. A close friend is somebody um, that you grow in closeness to precisely because you get to know them. You see them as the good that they are and you will, will their good precisely as some sort of, you know, something which is valuable that you see to be valuable. So you see spouses all the time, you know, they start out to get to know each other and they can't help, you know, continually trying to get to know each other. And the more uh, they sort of get to know each other, the more that they love each other and the more that they love each other, the, the more they want to know about each other. 
So having these sorts of um, uh, demonstrative proofs of God, and then, you know, there's more that we do with that. There's the whole, you know, philosophical exploration of the nature of God and how that fits in with what God has revealed about us. That's simply our sort of uh, coming to get to know God and filling out the relationship that we have with God. Um, it would be a very poor relationship that I had with my wife, let's say, if I didn't get to know, you know say everything about her, about her family, about her siblings, about, you know, um, well, you know, just everything about her. Um, it, it wouldn't be, you know, a very deep relationship that I had with her. Um, so similarly with God, if I am able um, to engage with those sorts of issues and, you know, come to know these things about God and engage with the philosophy and indeed with the theology of the matter, then my relationship with God is going to be all the more deeper precisely because I can do that. If there's somebody who is unable to do that, um, I mean, fair enough, we do have, you know, the revealed doctrines anyway. Um, for whatever reason, someone came to believe in God, they have believed in God, and then they give their assent to faith. Um, they may not be able to do all this sort of philosophical stuff. And indeed, at the very beginning of the Sumatology, I, Thomas says that if our salvation depended upon being able to think about God this way, you know, through natural reason and philosophy, only very few would be saved. And even after, you know, a, a very long time with a lot of errors, that's one of the reasons why we have um, revelation in scripture so that, you know, everybody of whatever ability, regardless of their philosophical acumen, um, can come to know God and have a relationship with God. But for those who are philosophically inclined and more intellectually inclined, this way is also open as a complement to that. How does that um, sit with your question? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. And would you say then, you know, like the, the miracles that have happened within the church, you know, the, the, all of that then being, would they, they're all like different, they're all different mediums through which people obviously come to that belief, isn't it? Uh, right. Um, okay, so... There's a few things to, to unpack there. I mean, there's only one sort of a, there's only one miracle that um, all Catholics de fide um, are required to believe in, and that's the resurrection of Christ. Um, so the other sort of miracles that, you know, you kind of say, you know, the, the miracles of the saints through the intercession of the saints, you know, throughout the history of the church, um, they kind of, you know, are complementary um, to the, um, the, the miracle of the resurrection and then how that kind of, you know, confirms um, Christ's claims um, within the Gospels, you know, his claims to divinity and then his claims, you know, to uh, suffering his death and rising again and all of that confirms, um, you know, Christ in the Gospels and then confirms what he reveals about God and so opens up, you know, uh, the whole life of faith. Whereas the other miracles there, the sort of the, the complementary stuff, they're akin to kind of having your faith confirmed not only by miracles but by through various experiences, life events, um, feelings, you know, of the presence of God uh, dur during prayer, during adoration, during mass, that sort of thing. Those other miracles are are in the same sort of uh, department as that, so not not different in kind, just different in degree. Um, from that, how does that how does that sit with your yeah, perfect. Perfect. yeah perfect, yeah, yeah. Can I ask a question related to that? Um, yeah. Uh, why, um, like, you, from from what you've said, like, you know, there's mm. you've given a proof of a prime cause or a prime mover, but um, why does, um, like, why would a prime mover, I don't know if this is something that we can arrive by reason itself, but why would a prime cause want a relationship with human mm. beings of all beings? Like, mm. there's so many animals and all of that. Like, you know, why is that? Is that something that we can know by reason or is it something that's purely because of revelation that we believe? Yeah, yeah. That's something <laughs> that kind of I, I went into in, in my, my book on creation or in the final chapter. It was a real fascinating um, discussion. It was a really, it was really enjoy good discussion to engage in. So, so this primary cause, um, so I, I, I kind of don't use the language of a prime mover because I think that's sort of, you know, ties us up too much um, with the, the, the Aristotelian sort, sort of notion, which isn't Thomas's, um, or at least I uh, argue isn't Thomas's. Um, so th th this primary cause, why would it want to have a relationship um, uh, with us? I think mean, Aristotle famously didn't think that the prime mover would want to have any sort of relationship with what was lower than it. It's the highest being. So why would it want to have a relationship with anything lower? 
This is where Thomas's Platonism or Neoplatonism comes in. Um, so just just a wee bit of kind of you know part of history on the Platonists and the Neoplatonists. Um, Plato held that at the height of all reality is what's called the form of the good, and that everything else, all other forms and everything which participates in the forms, uh, are some are participations in the form of the good. Um, now the Neoplatonists kind of take that and they run with that, and they hold that you have all these forms which things participate in, but there's something even beyond form. Uh, something beyond form itself, which kind of grounds form or gives reality to form. And then Plotinus, uh, that was called the one. Um, all forms are just participations in the unity of the one. And the one, precisely because it's one, is pure goodness itself. There's nothing other than the one which could be good for it, and it is the good for everything else. Thomas takes over that notion. Uh, for Thomas, um, because uh, this primary cause is just pure existence itself, there's nothing other than it which could perfect it in any way. There's nothing other than it that it stands in need of, which it acquires from something else. Whereas everything other than it has a very basic and fundamental need or is lacking in some sort of way, and that's lacking in existence. So everything that exists other than it is dependent for its existence. And so Anything at all which you know creatures have, any sort of actuality that they have, comes from this primary cause in some sort of way because it's the source of all existence. Now, when you think about goods, goods are sort of uh, what come along to fulfill a need. So we've got some very basic goods like food and drink. We're lacking, let's say, you know, we're hungry or we're thirsty, and food comes and sort of fills that lack, or you know, water comes and fills that lack, and you know, is thus a good for us. Uh, precisely because it's something that we do not do not have and we come to acquire it and it fulfills us in some sort of way and so is good for us. All creatures as dependent on this primary cause, they receive existence uh, from this primary cause and so they're all lacking in the most fundamental way uh, and thus depend on this primary cause for their existence. So this primary cause, this uh, pure existence itself, there's nothing outside of it on which it depends for anything. Everything else depends on it um, for its existence and then any sort of other sort of actualities that they have. That then entails that this primary cause of all things is the good of all things because nothing could attain whatever it lacks except through this primary cause of all things. So it's kind of like that Platonic good or, you know, Plotinus is one, which is pure goodness itself. All goodness then comes from it. And if it is just pure goodness itself, then here's the Neoplatonism again. The good is self-diffusive. The good seeks to diffuse itself amongst others. Because if you think about that, if you've got something which is just pure goodness, it would be a good thing to share that goodness with others. If it tried to keep its goodness to itself, it would be trying to guard its goodness as if it could lose it as if in giving its goodness to others, it would be lacking in goodness in some way. But if it's the pure source of all goodness, then it couldn't lack goodness in any way. So it seeks to diffuse it amongst others. And so Aquinas, he kind of integrates this with his philosophy of God. Because God, this primary source um, of existence is pure goodness itself, it seeks to diffuse its goodness to others. In other words, it seeks to kind of, you know, just spread out its goodness. And that's why it creates, that's its motivation to, to create. Um, because it sees that it would be good to create and then opts to do so, precisely so that uh, creatures can enjoy its goodness. Um, so it's not just human creatures that enjoy uh, the goodness of God. It's all creatures that enjoy the goodness of God, but they enjoy the goodness of God proper to the kind of creatures that they are. So bunny rabbits, cats, dogs, they all enjoy the goodness of God proper to the kinds of things that they are. Human beings can enjoy the goodness of God proper to the kinds of things that they are, i.e. rational animals. And as rational animals, we can come to know God with our intellects and we can come to love God through our wills. We come to know God as the good and thereby love God. And that means that we can enter into a relationship with God. There's a wee bit more to it than that. and There's more that we can draw out than that. You know, the place that humans have within creation, a more profound place than even the angels. I can get into that if you want, but if you think I've said enough thus far, 
Um, no, for now, I think this is enough for me to process anyway, unless someone else wants to hear more. Like, but yeah, okay. but it's just, just the second you to- uh, said about like the good that seeks to diffuse itself. Like I was mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, I know where it's going. Okay, great. Because we need that relationship and that's why that's what's good. And I get that. But just one more thing. Um, just when you said the one is always good, just by the fact that it is the one. Like mm-hmm. uh, how, why or how just, uh, I mean, why is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was from Plotinus. Um, so, so for Plotinus, uh, the one is at the base of all reality, because all reality, is, or we're, well, all things that exist are units in some sort of way. They're unified in some sort of way. So, I'm an individual unit. Everything else is an individual unit. So, there has to be some sort of principle of unity. Plotinus reasoned uh, by which everything is, because nothing would be unless it were unified in some sort of way. And this is the one. Um, now, the, so there, say that again. I didn't get that. Sorry about this. Yeah. The, the, there must be some sort. Of, according to Plotinus, there okay. must be some sort of principle by which anything at all is unified, uh, and this is the one. Okay, so everything is just an imitation of the one. Their unity is just an imitated unity of the one, uh, and that that's in Plotinus. And, so, uh, uh, does that mean like just by the fact that I am like I uh, uh, like I'm a being? It mm-hmm. means I'm imitating the original being of God yeah, yeah. of the for, world. For Plotinus, now Plotinus is a pagan. Okay. So, no, no, I, uh, I get you. Yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to get understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. For Plotinus, yeah, you're imitating okay. God's being, and even for Thomas as well, you're imitating God's being in a certain way. Um, okay. And so for Plotinus, the reason why the One is good is because there's nothing other than the One on which the One could depend. And the one sort of gives reality or actuality uh, or being to everything else, which is a good for everything else. So the one is the good in and of itself. It's not dependent. So, yep. Sorry, go on. Because it, it, it has no privations, because it has no needs, that means all the good is contained within itself. Yeah. And that's yeah. why it's good. Is, mm-hmm. is that what you're, what you're getting at? Or? And, and because it um, is the source of goodness for everything else, it is, the, it is the thing that satisfies all the needs of everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I'm just working on the definition of goods that you had explained earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of, okay, yeah. But, uh, no, I, I get you. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Thanks mm-hmm. so much. Um, yeah, so uh, I have a few other questions that people have asked me personally here. So okay. um, uh, so first one is like, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, so you said essential c- uh, series have have to have a primary cause, and mm. accidental uh, and accidental series don't. The example you used was a chain of fathers and sons. Why is that? Why can't why can there not be a first father who first fathered a son? Mm. Yeah, um, there can be. Um, all, all, all we're saying is that with accidental series, there need not be. There's no necessity that there has to be a primary cause or a, a first. There, there's no necessity that there has to be a first father, but it could very well, in fact, be there could very well, in fact, be some sort of first father. Um, so all, all we're saying is that there's no necessity that there has to be a first. Whereas with per se series, there is a necessity that there has to be a primary cause. And Gam, would I be right when you say that the the difference between the two theories is that, say, in a given timeline, when you look at it, one is, as you said. The cause is in within itself, as in with the heat and the 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 pan and then the contents of it. Like, but whereas mm-hmm. the father's son at a particular mm-hmm. time, it mm-hmm. could be infinite. Like when you look at it, because of the one about one in front and one one following it. Yeah, yeah. So um, with the um, what what one of the features of the per se series that some um, people think is essential to it is that um, everything in the series acts simultaneously or everything occurs simultaneously, occurs all at once. So that if you, if you remove anything from the series, the whole series falls down. So the fire heating the pot, heating the contents of the pot, that's a kind of a simultaneous sort of causal event. Whereas um, in the per accident series, it's successive. You know, the father produces his son. There's a causal event that happens with the production. And then that's it. You know, the son has the causality of the series as being male, and then he produces his, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's not a feature, a characteristic, um, a distinguishing feature, a characteristic of those series, which I particularly 
would, would opt for, but there are some other thinkers that would um, conceive of the theory, series in that way. I, I wouldn't. I, I think of it more in terms of dependency, of causal dependency. So in the per accident series, um, if you have um, some sort of effect dependent on its cause simply for its presence in the series, like James being in the series because Peter followed him, um, and yet that effect can uh, produce its own effect without the need for its prior cause to get without any sort of dependency on its prior cause after that, you've got a per accident series. So um, does that speak to your question? I guess, I guess that does. Uh, so Eric, um, you, you turn on your mic every now and then to ask a question, right? So if you want, you can fire away there. Well, yeah, now the one I, I uh, typed on up there is actually, I, I don't know if it's what is important to discuss at this point. I, I also, am a, I'm a professor philosophy in the United States, and I only know Professor Kerr from Facebook, but thank you for sending out your invitation, um, Professor, and letting us know this was going to be happening, to, uh, well, for us this afternoon, for you this evening. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know, do you want me to, does the host want me to uh, comment on what I brought up here on the comments, or uh, does that matter? I said I, uh, I can offer some thoughts on the primacy of being over essence. That was something somebody brought up early on, um, some things I could offer that might help but i don't know if that's still something people are particularly interested in or not i suppose you can give us maybe a small brief uh talk yeah i mean i would just say to me to me it seems i guess uh, fairly obvious i mean when i think of essence i think of a specific way of being right and we said we talk about the definition of a thing which already sort of implies in a sense of, of a foundational concept of infinity which is then parsed down into something more uh, definable, even the very word kind of implies that. So to me, I, I can't help but sort of think of this almost infinite horizon that we then are getting more specific about as we define things. And that's what we would think of in terms of a thing's definition or its manner of being, its essence. Um, so it seems to me that the, the very notion of talking about a, a way of specifying being already presumes being. Um, and in fact, if we somehow just imagined sort of a uh, conceptual universe of free-floating essences that we're waiting to receive being, it seems like we'd still have to say that it, it is something to be an essence, right? I mean, the essences with themselves would still have existence in some sense, maybe not a material existence, but some sort of, they would have some sort of being. And we further would have to say, you know, there's a definition of what it is to be an essence. And and this gets you also the Neoplatonic idea of having sort of an ultimate source uh, that's above definition itself uh, at the beginning of the series, uh, ontological series, um, because, you know, whatever it was that made all definitions definitions would itself have to transcend any finite way of being defined because it would have to cover all possible ways of definitizing or in other words defining things so that's the way I've come to sort of think of I don't know if Professor Kerr has any thoughts on that but that's how I've come to think I really don't know how to conceive of being as not being primary when you're talking about essence as a matter of specifying being mm. I mean, feel free to say whatever I don't know yeah yeah I mean that, that that would resonate with my own view that you know being would be primary and then essence is kind of you know a mode of being or, or a way of being or you know talking about that neoplatonic you know um view it's a way of being some sort of unit it's an imitation of the one in some sort of way so it's always going to presuppose being yeah and being itself could never be defined because it has to be the foundation by which things are like I like to try to stress the de definition as making something finite, right? Demarking it as finite in a specific way. So, so being itself would always be beyond any way of being finitized or defined, so to speak. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Eric, for that. Yeah. I awesome. appreciate that. Uh, yeah. There was uh, one other question now here is that um, for the per accident ex example, there would still need to be a primary father, right? A father that started the cause. So isn't the same as per se? Um, well, I'm not sure why there would need to be some sort of primary father, given, given the sort of, you know, dependency in the series. Um, you know, you could have one father, he brings about his son, the father dies, and then the son brings about his son, that, that son dies, and on and on and on. 
but you could just trace that. You could keep on tracing that back at any one time. You only have something which is actually a series which is actually finite, but there's no there, there's no necessity to stop at any point. Um, you may in fact stop. There may in fact be, you know, historically speaking, some sort of first member, uh, but there's no necessity to do that unless the question is suggesting that well that per accident series itself, that series of father sons needs some sort of cause outside of itself by which even it you know, is present in existence. Is, is that the sort of force of the question? Um, maybe the person who asked the question maybe can speak up. Yeah. I think. Um, if, no, I was just wondering, like, there would need to be a first father, like the, the father who started the series. So who created that father, you know? Like, you would need a cause outside of that father to create that series. Why, why would there need to be a first father in the series? So I, I kind of asked, like, I was going to ask a question related to that, like, which, uh, which is why this is confusing me too, to be honest. Because um, like, if it's a series where something causes something else, mm -hmm. like, w what is the thing that, like, uh, I mean, uh, conceptually, I can understand that it could be that it could go on forever. Mm -hmm. But um, historically, within time, um, uh, mm -hmm. can, uh, should there not be a start to the series? Because, um, like, at some point, um, like, I, I can understand conceptually, like, uh, you go back to, like, as far as you can to a man, and then you see, oh, wait, he has a father too, and then he has a father. It kind of goes back. Mm -hmm. So, like, the question I was uh, going to ask was, so, like, can existence be, like, an infinitely backward series? As in, yeah. you know, like uh, they say uh, with the universe, like before the Big Bang, there was another universe which crunched down into a yeah. tiny particle and then exploded again. And then yeah. that yeah. kind of has been happening yeah. at infinitum. Yeah. So like, yeah. would that, uh, like, is uh, that was my question. Would mm -hmm. that be realistically true or does time have a start to it? Okay, good. So um, a bit of history here. So fam Thomas famously in the 13th century held that even um, even if the universe didn't have a beginning, okay? So even if you had a beginningless universe, kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, regressive Big Bang models, um, there would still need to be a creator, okay? It would still need a primary cause. Uh, and this is something kind of, I, I engaged with Stephen Hawking uh, on this issue around about 2012, um, I published a paper, because Stephen Hawking in A Brief History of Time said that on his model of the Big Bang, there's no beginning uh, to the universe. Even though the universe is finite, there's no beginning to it. And if there's no beginning to the universe, there's no need for a creator. And the problem here with um, Stephen Hawking's um, account is that, well, first of all, this is an ignorance that, you know, you, you had Christian, well, at least one Christian theologian in the 13th century pointing out, well, no, you still do need a creator, even if the universe didn't have a beginning. And this is why. A creator isn't just there at the beginning to kick, to kick start things. That's not what creation does. That's not what this primary cause is doing. Rather, this primary cause grants existence to things. Anything which exists participates in the causal activity of uh, this primary cause. So everything, if the universe had the beginning, everything at the very beginning of the universe is participating in you know, this primary cause of existence, everything right now is participating in the primary cause of existence and everything in the future will be participating in the primary cause of existence. So it's being the primary cause, this is something I pointed out um, with the, the two series, it's being a primary cause is not it's being first in a series, rather it's being a primary cause is that it possesses the causality of the series in and of itself. Uh, and that's what makes it primary. So everything depends on it simply because it has the causality in and of itself. There was a famous kind of um, uh, cosmological argument for God known as the Kalam cosmological argument. And the idea is that whatever has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause. This causes God. That's a very sort of trite way of putting it, but that's the general strategy of the argument. That's not this kind of argument. This kind of argument is that anything which is dependent for its existence depends on some sort of primary source of existence to originate its existence in the way that everything on the earth depends on the sun for its illumination. Um, wherever it exists and at whatever moment it exists, um, it depends on the sun. So it, it, it's not the idea that we're going right back to a first. So um, that, that, that's not what this argument has argued. 
with regard then to the fathers and sons, there could in fact be um, a, you know, sort of first member of the species, you know, who's the first father who procreates. Um, that's just a fact of the matter, um, if, if that is the case. There's no necessity that that has to be. And so if we're going to model causal series um, off the back, let's say of fathers producing sons as a kind of causal chain, um, there's no necessity that there has to be any sort of uh, first within that series. Uh, and that's just, that just exhibits something of the nature of per accident's or ordered series. That's why we use the father-son example. Whereas in per se series, you know, there is a necessity. We do need um, some sort of primary cause without which the members of the series wouldn't have their causality. Now, let's say you have an infinite, you know, sort of father-son series. It's actually finite, but it's potentially infinite. It could go on forever. Um, uh, or let's say the universe is without a beginning. Um, the universe doesn't exist in virtue of what it is, in virtue of being a universe. Its existence isn't identical to it or to any of its parts or anything like that. In that case, it's just like any one of those members in a per se series. It's dependent for its existence. And so unless there's some sort of primary cause, which is just pure existence itself, then uh, there's no hook on which the universe could hang, even if the universe had no beginning. Um, so you can have a, you know, a, a, an infinite universe or a beginningless universe still in need of some sort of primary cause for its existence. How does that sit? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just to clarify something. I can, so, sorry. Oh, sorry. If, Go on, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, uh, thanks to Dr. K for a very wonderful job, well done. But I think um, the, the issue we're talking about is, is so big and so vast that I don't think 40 minutes will have been able to do justice to all we need to understand because I, 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 the questions coming up is just a clear indication of how much uh, the discussion, I mean, listening to Dr. K, I could see jumping from cosmology to epistemology to history of philosophy to metaphysics and putting all that together and giving it in 40 minutes was such an exceptional work. I, 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 I was just marveled at his ability to put all these different um, uh, departments of uh, philosophy or dynamics of philosophy, and he's able to bring all of them together. Even the Thomistic argument is a long discussion, and all that he has brought them together. So I feel if, if we're just going to sit down here and keep throwing back questions at each of those vocabularies, because these vocabularies are not just vocabularies that you can just uh, explain them so easily, like existence, essence, being, uh, primacy uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, primary cause, secondary cause, all those things are big concepts, are high philosophical concepts that have so much that if we don't go into the depth and discuss them one at a time. So for me, I feel uh, what we have had today is just like uh, a kickstart. We are just kickstarting a discussion where maybe we could still need him on another session. Maybe when we sit down and look at all that he had said and we're able to pick out those areas we need him to elaborate more and then we put up our questions and then he's coming next time with prepared uh, mindset of our expectations i think that's when we are, we'll be able to satisfy our curiosity but if anybody tells me that at this session we are going to get everything and leave this session happy feeling we have got all we need i doubt it very much because the concepts are very elaborate the concepts are very dynamic and there's so much explanation, there's so much play on words that we need yeah. to dig into too. But the wonderful thing I got at the beginning was the fact that uh, uh, the existence of God is not a prerequisite for faith, you know. We have to believe first before we go into that faith. I was really touched by that, those words, and I feel if I'm leaving this session today, that's what I'm taking home, that I mustn't be thinking of till I prove the existence, but my faith is a continuation of that basic background that I believe there is a God and then I'm beginning to search him in the Judeo-Christian tradition precisely as a Catholic. But if we don't have that basic background, then our search will always be a search for the unknown. Once more, thank you, Dr. Kerr. Great, uh, so we have time for like, uh, just uh, I'm, I can see Antonio is there ready to ask a question, but we'll have only about five minutes left roughly to ask questions. So Antonio, you can take the second last question. Then I have one last question to ask Dr. Kerr and then that'll be it for today. I know we can talk on for ages, but uh, due to time limits and you know, we'll all have to go and 
Dr. Gavin also has to take his time out as well. So uh, Antonio, if you want to ask your second last question, if you want. Antonio? I okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, am I on, on the call now? Yeah, can yeah. You hear I, me? Can hear you. I can hear you now, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Gavin Kerr. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. very much impressed with your expose. Uh, thanks to my uh, classmates, uh, Pro Professor Bernard. Uh, actually, when we were taught about uh, uh, this theology or epistemology and metaphysics, we were discussing about apot apopasis of God's creation, of God's uh, essence and existence. We can only know God for what it is not, and not exactly what God is because uh, of our human limitations and knowledge. But since we are uh, all believers, theists, and not atheists, uh, we have certain description of God, which we can call about the, uh, the uh, burning bush experience. So when you discuss about the Don Scotus idea of hesitancy and the distance of God, I mean that that's where the uh, the conflict with Thomas. I think when Thomas was more of the empirical one, he tries to reason out with with his own description of God. Uh, I, I I learned a lot from you. But uh, the, the most things that uh, struck me is about when you try to say about infinite regress, when, when, when it's going to be stopped. I mean, this kind of debate in the, in the epistemology, when reductionism is often used uh, in our uh, debate. But, but Thomas, I think, uh, made it more clear that the prime over is the one that is uh, creating the existence and essence as one in, in that kind of causality and necessity. And this is the one that that, that were that you hit right on the right, right chord. The other accidental things and so on were just uh, the debate on on hesitancy and etc. But the apopasis is still on the right track. Okay. I don't know if you you got me because I, I started with the what it is not, what God is not. I mean, because you started the, the, the burning bush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do, Thank you. do we have, do, do we have a question, a particular question? Uh, the, the particular question is that uh, we are still uh, trying to grapple our own uh, description of God. Mm. But basically, in terms of our epistemology, we are much in touch with with the essence and the existence of God. Okay, Is okay, that right? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure what the actual que what the actual question is. Uh, our our limitation is it's a kind of a Wittgenstein idea. We mm -hmm. have limited language. Yep. In in describing God. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In, yeah. In terms okay. of what Fergus Kerr was saying, okay. uh, yeah, we yeah, cannot yeah. know God essentially, but we can only know God what, what it is not. Apophasis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so what this is what this is bringing up. So, for those who, who haven't engaged with this uh, area before, is that um, what what we've been dealing with is the, the the existence of some sort of primary cause, and then once we do that, um, you get into the issues of what would this primary cause have to be like in order to be primary? Uh, we kind of we kind of saw a wee bit of that with goodness, um, but um, we see these sorts of discussions come up. That well, you know, for it to be primary in this sort of way, it would have to be intelligent, willing, omnipotent, um, infinite, eternal, all the rest. Um, the question is, well, when we know God like that. What are we really knowing? Are we knowing God in his essence in the same way that, you know, revelation, you know, kind of the scripture reveals God as triune, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or what is it that we're knowing about God? Now, there's a tradition in theology, uh, it's called the apophatic tradition or the way of negation. But when we know these sorts of things about God, really, we're just saying what God is not. You know, okay, so God is eternal. Well, he's non-temporal. God is infinite, well, he's non-finite. God is simple, well, he's non-composite. That's the idea, and that's known as the ap apophatic way. Um, and Thomas employs that. Um, he, he, he gets that uh, from a Jewish thinker. Moses Maimonides um, was a major contributor in that respect. 
But Thomas also has a way called uh, an analogical way um, for naming God, where you can make genuine positive affirmations about what God is like. Um, so what we say about God is true of God. When we say that God is good, we genuinely mean that God is good, not just that he's not evil. But the way in which we ascribe goodness to God is different from the way in which we ascribe it to creatures, let's say. So when we say that God is good, for example, um, God is essentially good. God is good in virtue of what he is, whereas humans are limited in their goodness or any creature is limited in its goodness because it's just a limited imitation of God's uh, divine goodness. So no creature is just the good in and of itself. So what we ascribe to both God and creatures is the same. We ascribe goodness to both. But the way in which we ascribe it to God is different from the way in which we uh, describe it, ascribe it to creatures. And Thomas argues uh, that beyond the way of negation, the apophatic way, we can also have this way of affirmation, this, this way of analogy uh, to do that. So that's kind of just, you know, what's being brought out in that, uh, that issue which is being brought up there. Did Very we good. have a, a final you. question? That was the second last question. So that's the second. The last question is, is, is a very small question. I'm going to end it with this one, which is like, the question is, uh, how do you, uh, how do you grow like a slick beard like yours? How to grow? <laughs> 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 so that was the quite last question I got today. So how to grow right. a beard like yours? <laughs> right. You go through. Um, okay. So, so I've known my wife, I'm 37. I've known my wife since I was 15. She's always here at beards. All right. Always here at beards. <laughs> So I got married when I was 22. Um, so, so I've been with her, with her since I was 15, married when I was 22. Um, and so 15 years married this year. You go through that whole part of your relationship and your 20s, the first eight years of marriage or so, without a beard. You know, then, you know, you've got a mortgage, you're settled down, you have several kids and you're like, well, you know what? You know, we're so many years married, we're settled down, I'm growing a beard and that's that. And so, so you stand up to your, to your wife uh, in that way. And then you grow a beard and then um, you just, that's that. You don't say anything and then you shave it someday and your wife gets angry at you for shaving the beard off, which has come to get used to and which she prefers that way. And precisely because you missed all those, you know, sort of 10 years or so of beard growth, you kind of just have to, you know, keep growing it and get back in those 10 years. And you also find a good manly barber that, you know, can kind of, you know, <laughs> your beard, beard for you and everything and then you get a couple of tattoos and you know that's how it works great thank you so much uh, dr gavin today for you know spending time with us and you know giving a good explanation the co cosmological explanation of you know how to pro go about proving god today so you know from the bottom of all our hearts and uh, on behalf of everyone you know thank you so much dr gavin mm -hmm. for being with us and all of uh, uh and more, more, more than that for all those who are coming today thank you so much for coming so next week uh we will be having the second part of the talk which is on you know um you know so today uh, dr gavin talked about um well, how to go approving god now next week will be you know why you know why the catholic god why should we uh, believe in the one and only catholic god so please do join us next week on wednesday at 6 30 so it's going to be on a wednesday at 6 30 on this it's going to be the same id uh, so and also i know a lot of us uh didn't get to ask questions and i apologize for the time limit on that but you can definitely reach to reach out to dr gavin on his facebook page uh, and he'd be more than happy to answer those questions for you as well and you can if you want to have a debate go ahead there's nothing wrong <laughs> dr gavin's always ready for a debate so um before we split in our own ways um father pontian is going to give us a small final blessing and then we shall depart for tonight so father pontianus if you can give us a small final blessing for us and dr gavin as well please oh father you're on mute just <laughs> the lord be with you and with your spirit and also with you I mean, Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, Hope you all have a good night. Take care.